I love talking about this part because it's probably the most important stuff in all of steam heating, it's venting. Because steam and air are gases that have different densities. Where there is air, steam will not go. So we got to be able to vent the system every time it starts up. So let's talk about the air vents. This is a very common air vent that's made by Hoffman Specialty. It's called the number 40, and I show it to you because there's so many of them out there. Now it's got this little piece that sticks inside the radiator that is appropriately called a tongue. And the tongue is there to let the condensate that gets stuck in the in the trap to, uh, in the radio vent, radiator vent the drain out. It just dribbles along the bottom of the tongue back into the radiator. This is a float that has a flexible bottom. And the float is partly filled with a mixture of alcohol and water. And it's sealed. And when steam hits this, it causes the stuff on the inside to boil. And when that boils, it expands and it pushes the bottom part out. So the bottom pops out and it drives the pin up into the seat. At this point, the vent is closed. And this is kind of like hanging in space because it's sitting up there. On, and, and even when it cools off, it's still hanging in space because the steam pressure is pushing against the bottom of it, keeping it closed. So what we want to happen is the float to fall so that we can have venting again. And that's where this thing called drop away pressure comes in. Vent valve manufacturers in their literature, they, they call it either operating pressure or drop away pressure. And it's the pressure through which the system must cycle down at the end of every cycle. And that's where the pressure troll comes in. So drop away pressure works like this. Let's say you're starting up and you got uh, steam pressure. Like, so you get to 2 PSI or 5 PSI, whatever you're running. And you're pushing with relatively low pressure against a big wide bottom. And that is shutting the vent. Now that's being opposed by atmospheric pressure that's trying to fit in through this little hole. So it's kind of like what makes a, a car lift in a garage work, right? You put, you got a big surface, big piston, small piston. This is trying to push down, this is pushing up. So when you got steam pressure on here, if it's on there all the time, this is gonna keep the vent closed. It stays closed all the time. That was the challenge that we had with that, that New York City housing project that was, was taking Con Edison steam, which, which came in at a constant pressure and never dropped. The constant pressure just held the vents closed. And before the air is out, the radiator is full of air. Steam's trying to get in, the radiator won't get hot because the air can't get out. So we want to lower the pressure so that the weight of this float can overcome the closing force and venting can continue beyond the first cycle. So that's called drop away pressure. We got to get below that point. Now, back in the day, companies like Hoffman Specialty made vents like this. Now, this was a main vent. Look at the size of this thing. It's, it's 10 and 3 quarter inches high with a 3 quarter inch tapping. This is an air vent. This thing is like a car muffler. And you, you just imagine the massive amount of air that this thing could vent. And this, this was developed during the time when we began to move away from coal and toward the automatic fuels of oil first and then natural gas afterwards. Because, because those automatic fuels change things dramatically. Here's what I mean. When you, when you start up a boiler, the steam's going to form. We're going to have an air vent down the end here. And they might put that Hoffman number, number 10 down there. And when the steam starts up, we want this to happen. We want the steam to move through the header, out into the system, and down that line. We want that to happen. Now, there's a, there was a system uh, developed by the oil guys in the 1930s that they called master venting. And the original articles uh, that these guys wrote are all on heatinghelp.com. If, if you want to read them, just drop me a line at dan at heatinghelp.com, and I'll... I'll point you right at them. But the, but it was the oil guys complaining about how in the days of coal, they would pipe the coal boiler in a certain way. The, the coal boiler would often be near the street because that's where the coal chute was and the coal bin. So that put that put the boiler on the outside of the house, which is also why chimneys are on the outside of the house. It just became a traditional thing to do. Now, since they were firing coal, which would come on and run for you know eight hours or 10 hours continuously, they were able to run perimeter mains around the around the whole building so that so they'd come off the off the coal boiler which was near the wall and they would run down to the corner with the main and then down to the other corner and and just work their way around until they got back to the boiler so you, you're basically surrounding the whole building with this main and off of that they would run their risers that go, would go up to the radiators and the radiators would be positioned under the windows at each room so that's the way it was done now when you switch over to an automatic fuel you need to put a thermostat somewhere in that building. And the oil guys would come in and they'd position the thermostat somewhere in the middle of the building, figuring that that was a good neutral spot. 
Well, the problem was the perimeter main that was designed to run with a coal fire would get hot about halfway around and the thermostat would be satisfied. So now they had heat on one side of the building and no heat on the other side of the building. So that, so that the oil guys were faced with this challenge and, and they realized that if they were putting in a new steam system, they would now for the first time, rather than use this perimeter main that went around the whole building, they would come off the header with, with multiple mains and they would go you know, left side with one, right side with the other, time together on the other side and bring them back through wet return. Or they would, they would go even more run out. So when you're on an old job, if you see that perimeter main, know that you're looking at a job that was piped to fire coal. And if you see a manifold coming off the header with multiple takeoffs going in opposite directions, that was a job that was piped to fire an automatic fuel. So in their articles back in the 30s, they talked about dealing with the distribution of these piped for coal jobs by using master venting. And what they did was what you see here in this, in this picture. They put a big main vent like that Hoffman number 10 at the end. Now you could apply this same kind of logic nowadays by doing this. Walk down the end of the main, get out of the boiler room, don't be a flame head. Get out of the boiler room, wander through the building, and when you get down the end of the main, you're looking for a vent. Ask yourself this question, if I were air, could I get out? And you're looking for a main vent somewhere down the end of the line. I guarantee you, when you get down the end of the line, you're either going to find a vent that's, that's broken and, and stuck closed, or you're going to find where a vent used to be and there's a pipe plug in its place. Or you're going to find a little radiator air vent drilled into the side of the main, which is crazy because it can't vent much air other than what's in a radiator. So you got to look at that. And when you find that hole that's now plugged, I want you to take the plug out of the hole with the system off and then go back there and start the boiler. Put your hand on the header. As soon as the header gets hot, that's telling you that steam is now leaving. Okay, now when the header gets hot, run down to the end. You're going to be running a stopwatch now. So when this gets hot, start the stopwatch run down to the end and see how long it takes for the steam to come out of the hole. That is the venting rate of the hole on the main. Does that make sense? Good. So now what you want to do is select the proper size vent that can vent that much air in that amount of time as if it wasn't there. So in other words, you're, you're picking a vent that has the capacity to vent of the open hole. And if you want the steam to move even faster, you can add holes and vents. So this is master venting. So the steam will now favor the main and not go up the rises till it reaches the end of the main. So let's take this a step further here. Uh, Jerry Gill and Steve Pajak are two very, very sharp contractors who work out of Cleveland, Ohio, where there's a lot of steam heat. And Jerry and Steve have been friends of mine for years and years, and they put together this balancing steam systems using a venting capacity chart, which you can look at for free on heatinghelp.com. And you could use all this. And they did this in 2005, and they've been updating it ever since. Now, Jerry and Steve knew about master venting, and they were out there using the vent, the vent valve venting rates that the manufacturers of the, vent, of the venting rates published. But those were published back in the 1930s and 40s. And Jerry and Steve began to suspect that they weren't that accurate. So they went out and they got everybody's main vents, the current ones, and they also had antique air vents. They, they went out and tested every air vent, and not only air vents, but also steam traps, because before a trap can trap steam, it has to vent air. They tested everybody's air vents, and they, they did this using a Dwyer meter, which could measure the venting of air through a, through a very tiny orifice at just one, two, or three ounces of pressure differential. And they published their findings in this, and it was eye-opening because none of the manufacturer's literature held true. It was, all, it was all off, and it was off by a lot. And they realized this by trying to balance systems, and they weren't getting anywhere. So they came out with this, and this changed everything. So what Jerry and Steve did was they looked, for instance, at, at the venting capacity of main vents. And this showed you all of that. And you could just see these magnificent differences. And then they said, okay... Uh, let's let's make more main vents. So so they began to talk about this, and a lot of it got passed on through HeatingHelp.com. And this was one job that was done not by Jerry and Steve, but by by a, a fellow we call Steamhead, who works out of uh, Baltimore. And Steamhead is uh, Frank Wilsey, that's his name. And Frank went out there, and he went into a hundred-year-old apartment building that had problems for a hundred years and really really high fuel bills. And Frank went in there and master vented it. And Frank added 25 main vents and lowered a $35,000 fuel bill by 32%. He did this with vents. Now, that's what I call low-hanging fruit. There's no reason to rip out the steam system if you want to be more efficient. There's no reason to redo the whole building. 
you, you just need to tweak. You just need to know what it is you're doing, and you can get results that are just like that. 32% savings on a $35,000 annual fuel bill with 25 main vents. This can be done. In New York City, there's a friend of mine named Paul Shea who runs a company called It's a Real Good a Real Good Plumber. And Paul goes out into these older buildings in Lower Manhattan and does the same thing with master venting. Look at the amount of air vents we're talking about here to get the system to heat very quickly. Look at this. And they get incredible results by doing this. System operates on several ounces of pressure. We're talking big buildings here. Several ounces of pressure, no hammering, no noise, even heating, low fuel bills. It's all being done with venting and through this master venting approach. So we're gonna do this. We're gonna get the steam to go down the end. And we, the way we do that is we measure the air that's in that pipe and we put in an appropriately sized vent. The next thing we wanna do is look at the risers because that's our next challenge. So we're gonna vent the tops of each of these risers. And then we're gonna measure the air that's in this pipe going up. I'm gonna size that vent to handle only that air, this vent to handle only this air, and so on. And then we look at the radiator air vent and we say, okay, that only has to handle the air that's going in this pipe and the radiator itself. So many times you'll hear people say, well, if the radiator is far from the boiler, you have to heat it, or you have to vent it quickly. And if it's near the boiler, you have to vent it slowly. Well, that's not true. In fact, in 1930s, the oil guys wrote literature where they said, that's just not so. Now, the reason <laughs> this a mess of venting came to be because if the radiator is far from the boiler and it happens to be a small radiator, that's because it's in a small room. If it's near the boiler and it's a big radiator, it's in a big room. So a big radiator has got more air in it than a small radiator. And if our goal is to get every radiator in the whole building to heat at the same time, obviously we have to vent the big radiator faster than the small radiator because the big radiator contains more air. So by master venting, since, since we put in vents that will favor the, the steam to go up the main vents, uh, the main rises and down to the end of the main. When steam comes up, it doesn't go right to the radiators. It blasts down to here. It goes up the rises. And, and I'm talking about speeds that are that are crazy fast. There was a, I did a seminar in New York recently. And a guy was there who, who was the guy that was in charge of the re-engineering of the heating system in the Empire State Building. And I was talking about the Empire State Building and how it runs on low pressure and such. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, Dan, you know, I got to tell you, um, I'm, I'm that guy and I was delighted to meet him. And he said, we, we were trying to figure out, you know, how fast steam will move if, if, <laughs> if we allow it. He says, and a lot of the stuff we had gotten out of your, your book, The Lost Art of Steam Heating, when we were doing this. And, uh, and he says, above the main... Uh, Above the main observation area, there's a, there's a smaller observation area at the Empire State Building. And above that, there's a room with a radiator. He says, nobody goes up there except the people that work there. He says, that's on a riser. He says, I, I had them close the valve in the basement. And I stood up there in that room. And I phoned down to them. And I said, open the valve. He says, the heat was at that radiator in moments. He says, you are so right. This stuff wants to move at the speed of sound. He says, the only thing standing in its way is the air. So there's a real story for you. And this is stuff that anybody can do if you just look at that booklet, which is on our website, and it's free. And you go out and you get yourself a pipe caliber, which you can also get on our website to see how much air is in the pipe. And then you look at this chart, which is also in that booklet, which is on the website, which is free, Jerry and Steve's booklet. You want to know how much air is in a two-inch pipe? Well, there's that much per linear foot, that many cubic feet per linear foot. How about in a radiator? Well, you figure out what kind of radiator you have. If it's a, if it's a cast iron column radiator, the classic steam ones, well, it's 0.025 cubic feet per square foot of EDR. So if you know the EDR rating, you know how much air is in there. Knowing this, you could do anything. You could do stuff other people say is impossible. So we vent by volume, not by the location. We don't vent fast radiator, uh, vent fast because it's far, it's slow because it's near the boiler. You vent by volume, not by location. This stuff works, my friend. And then Jerry so beautifully said, before a trap can trap steam, it must vent air. So the steam goes out at the end. It's climbing up the ladder. The radiators are the rungs on that ladder. These red dots are the steam traps. It's pushing the air through here into the return, and it's got a vent over here. So Jerry and Steve did something that nobody in this industry had ever done before. They tested the venting rates of steam traps using their dwire meter. And what they found was pretty interesting. 
You know, there's a lot of stuff here in that booklet. For instance, the uh, the Hoffman 17C with the half inch capsule that comes with it has a venting rate of 0.53. Now, if you re exchange that with a Barnes and Jones cage unit, the replacement part, the venting rate goes up by two and a half times. So, th this has a this has meaning when you're when you're changing traps in a riser that goes up through say the bedrooms of an apartment building. You know, 1A, 2A, 3A, and so on. Uh, if you change some of the traps and repair them with certain parts and other traps and use other parts, uh, your vending rate is going to be way different and your distribution is going to be way different. So knowledge is power. And the more you know about this, the more problems you can solve.